want to check if all the presenters are there. Ah, you you check, madam. Ah. Huh? Okay. Ah. Huh. Uh, can first you is, can you just uh, check if you want if the presenters are there okay first is dr richa is there yes dr. yes dr jaypal is there ah uh. dr k asok yes sir i am here okay, yeah okay. he's there then dr b shina dr b shina okay okay then next chaleja Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. Okay, okay. Then, Doctor Monica. Doctor Monica. May be coming. Uh, Doctor Archana Sanyal. Doctor Deepika Kalal is there. Uh, Doctor. Yes, sir. may be coming eh ah oh, dr sina is also coming eh uh, dr madhu patial may be coming dr v devpa dr devpa okay dr romila uh, yes sir i am here okay okay dr sunita yadav ha ah, ji ji yes i am present okay 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 most probably 90% is coming i want to Maybe not. Yeah, one or two are not there. I okay. think they may join. Ah, uh, maybe join now. No problem. Yeah. Can we start, madam? Yeah, sure. Okay. good afternoon to all of you so today is fourth session on technical session uh, on crop management for abiotic and abiotic species in this session chairman professor m premji singh ji vice chancellor cau imphal uh, may be joined uh, within one hour up to 3 o'clock and co chairman of this session is dr chandesh r blal ex director icr nbr bengaluru reporter myself and dr richa vasne and in this session total one keynote speaker and 13 oral presenter then first of all i read the bio data uh, dr uh, chandesh r balal as a keynote speaker so i start dr chandesh r balal madam ex director icr nbr bengaluru obtained her bsc msc m phil degree from calicut university her phd degree from mysore university her first post posting as a scientist was at icr ihr uh, bangalore in 1985 and later she moved on to the pdbc during the formative years which is now upgraded to icr nbar she was the head of the division of insect ecology from 2013 to 16 and director of icr nbr from 2016 to 20 she has handled around 40 research project and has more than 300 research publication including research in pure journal and book chapter edited book technical bulletin symposium to her credit she has received international travel grant from dst iobc csir kb icr fao beijing academy of science to present her research paper in international uh, conference in india greece china and sri lanka nepal bangkok and usa she is an elected fellow of several professional societies and is the recipient of several awards recognition including professor t n antakrishna award in 2006 dr sita namar award in 2010 11 nbir scientific excellence award 2015 dr s p singh by control lifetime achievement award 2016 the prestigious uh, icr punjab rao deshmukh outstanding women agriculture scientist award in 
and most recently Dr. S. Pardhan Memorial Award 2018 from IRI New Delhi. Uh, Dr. Prem uh, Dureja Endowment Award for the Biennium 2017-18 from the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences. Dr. B. V. David uh, Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019. Throughout the year career by way of training of stakeholders, publication related to biodiversity, bio control, guiding, providing to students, farmers, interaction and supply to uh, quality biological control agent. She has made considered uh, efforts to create awareness on the importance of a healthy environment and to popularize the concept of biological control among all the stakeholders and many more achievement is there. But due to the uh, shortage of time, I request Dr. Uh, Sandesar Balal to start your keynote address. Uh, thank you, Dr. Haldar, uh, uh, for welcoming and giving an introduction. Um, this session, I think I've also been given the responsibility to act as a co-chair. And uh, the VC, I think, is going to join us after some time. So he would be chairing the session, um, maybe after he arrives. So this session is on crop management for abiotic and biotic uh, stress. Now, after my presentation, there would be 13 more presentations. Um, and since there is a question answer session, uh, I would request all the attendees to kindly um, enter your questions in the question answer uh, box over there so that uh, in case there is no time, the speakers can themselves respond. And I would also request the attendees to please uh, note the email addresses of all the speakers so that you can directly contact because we do not know how this will go on, how much time it will take. So with this, uh, let me start my presentation. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Haldar and Honorable VC for uh, um, giving me this opportunity to present my paper. So um, I think it's visible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, everything is fine, I suppose. So uh, let me start my presentation. Um, actually, what I'm aiming to do in this presentation uh, is to speak about the strainal variations in biocontrol agents. Let them be parasitoids or predators or biopesticides, that is microbials. I just want to say that within a species also, there can be a lot of variations. The same species, different populations, there can be variations. We call them intraspecific variations. Now, some variations are... Um, evident morphologically, some variations within the same uh, species. For example, if you talk about Trichogramma chelonis, the same Trichogramma chelonis could have variations in different populations. Um, now, um, 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 but what I am trying to focus here is, there are other than morphological variations, there are biological variations, physiological variations and behavioral variations amidst the different uh, races or strains of uh, bioagents. Now, the, these variations will lead to their differences in tolerance to climate extremes, tolerance uh, and responses to the uh, factors like probably the chemical pesticide pressures. There could be variations in their uh, parasitizing or predating efficiency on a particular host or a host plant. So here I'm not trying to define what is the difference between races, strains, populations, biotypes. People call it differently. Only what I want to say here is within a species, there could be variations in individuals which will determine whether a parasitoid or a predator or a biopesticide bio is effective or not. Now, first, a couple of examples for morphological variations in bioagents. Uh, this first example is Trichogramma sembilidus. It is a trichogrammatic parasitoid. Now here, amongst the male individuals of the same species, dimorphism has been observed. That is, 
depending on from which host tech they are emerging, they can be elate forms or they can be apterous form, winged or wingless forms. Similarly, this is a braconid parasitoid, the next plate which I have put up here. Now, uh, depending on whether the host is a leaf curling aphid or whether it is a non-leaf curling aphid, this parasitoid, a braconid, which is called aphidirus persicae, can have variations in its wing shape. Now, this I am in, uh, uh, emphasizing because these kind of variations are extremely important for taxonomists who work on by control agents. Now, um, based on the host specificity or crop specificity, there have been strains which have been determined by researchers. Now, in our earlier institute, our institute right now, NBAIR, which was earlier called the Project Directorate of Biological Control, there have been strains which have been identified specifically for certain host insects. For example, BioSC indicates it's a strain of trichogramma chelonis, which is specific for graminaceous tissue borers. Bio C1 and C6 was supposed to be very effective against bollworms. Bio H1 was a trichogramma chelonis strain, specifically effective for Helicoverpa armigera. Now, the next example, I'm giving an example outside India. There is a tachinid parasitoid which is called Trichopoda penibus. Now, the strain which was collected from the eastern states, it could attack corid uh, bugs, that is like Anasa tristis and other corid bugs. Now, those which were collected from the southeastern states, it could attack Nizara viridula and other pentatomids. And the strain which was collected from California, it could attack Ureophthalmus uh, uh, cinctus californicus, which is a pyrochorid. So here, the parasite is one, but the different strains had different effectivity based on the host. Now, many such studies were conducted in India also. Nantesia flavipus, I think you all know that it is a parasitoid of Chylopartilus in India. This was released in Africa against uh, Chylopartilus originally, that is the maize stem borer, but when it was released into the uh, ecosystem in Africa, it started parasitizing sugarcane borers and a strain was adapted which started performing better on sugarcane borers, which is very surprising because Cotasia flavicus is basically a parasitoid for Chylopartilus, which is the maize stem borer. Now, Cryptolemus montrosi, the exotic uh, predator which is now almost an indigenous predator. Originally, it was supposed to be a tree inhabiting uh, predator when it was initially imported uh, by India from abroad. Now, we are releasing it often on grapevine against the mealybugs. It has become adapted to grapevine. Now, the third study that is on Campolitis chloridae, this was conducted by me uh, much earlier in 2001. Now, here, uh, I could collect Campolitis chloridae parasitoid from pulses ecosystem and also from cotton ecosystem. Now, the very interesting part was that the parasitoid population obtained from pigeon pea ecosystem, that is pulses ecosystem, could not parasitize Helicoverpa armigera larvae from the cotton ecosystem. Similarly, only those Campolitis from cotton ecosystem could parasitize Helicoverpa larvae from the cotton ecosystem. So there was some kind of a crop specific strain. Now there are strains which are also adapted to extreme abiotic factors or um, you know conditions which are not generally congenial for the parasitoids. The first example is of a tachinid parasitoid which is called Metagony stylum minens. Now there are some strains or races of this parasitoid which is very well adapted to wetness of the habitat, though other strains were not adapted this way. Also, uh, at uh, NBAIR, when it was NBAI, in the biotechnology section, they had collected Cryptolemus predator from different regions. Now, what they found was that the populations which were collected from Coimbatore and Shimoga, they could tolerate high variable temperatures, which means this population which were collected from Coimbatore and Shimoga would perform well in those areas where there is a lot of variation in temperature. Now, uh, we would always look for 
natural enemies, which are more tolerant to chemical pesticides because we feel if there is a lot of chemical pesticide pressure, these natural enemies should be able to perform even when there is a pesticide pressure. So generally what we find is that those populations which are collected from areas where there is no pesticide pressure, they are very susceptible because they are not exposed to pesticide pressure. So this was done in China, where in 2001 it was published with respect to a parasitoid which is called Diadigma insular. Now, uh, the work done in India, it indicated that the Shimla population of Cotasia flavipus, it was less susceptible to fenvalrate and endosulfan, and the populations of Chrysoperla carnea, uh, which was five populations were collected, which was surprisingly found to have multiple tolerance to two classes of insecticides. Similarly, one more work was that a population which was collected from Sirsa of Chrysoperla zestrovisilami, that is the chrysopid, the common chrysopid, it was tolerant to monocrotophores, and the Delhi and Bangalore populations of uh, cryptolemus was tolerant to esophate. Now, uh, there are also variations in behavioral or biological parameters. For example, there is a parasitoid called uh, Trisolcus basalis. This is a very good parasitoid for uh, Nizara viridula. That is a, a bug. Uh, so this Australian strain of this parasitoid was found to have very good fecundity. Now, this is very important because when you have a parasitoid, you should be able to multiply it in large numbers. So if it is one with a very good high fecundity, it is worth bringing it into the laboratory and to multiply. Now, that is not sufficient. Even if it has very good uh, uh, biological parameter, superior biological parameter, there should be good searching behavior, good walking speed, and excellent host location behavior. Now, in this context, uh, studies were done on African and Turkish strains of Elinomus uh, parasitoid. This is a very good parasitoid for corn stock border. Now, what they found was that though longevity and fecundity were almost similar, the searching behavior and parasitizing behavior was better in the in certain strains, but not in all, though other biological parameters were same. Now, various studies have compared the local strains and imported strains. For example, in India, we have diadigma semiclosum. But uh, long back when Dr. Singh was our director, we had imported diadigma semiclosum from Taiwan because the studies indicated that was a very superior strain. So diadigma semiclosum is a uh, parasitoid of the Dan bat moth. Now, we compared these strains and what we found was that there was absolutely no difference. However, a similar situation arose when Cotasia flavipus was introduced from Indonesia. Though we have Cotasia flavipus, we introduced because there was a, um, a, a, a report that the Indonesian strain is also very effective against the sugarcane borer, not the maize borer. So we imported and it was found that the imported strain had higher person parasitism. So in some cases, there is no point in importing. In some cases, the imported strains work better. Now, why do we connect the strains and the strategy of biological control? So there is a beautiful example in California, in the United States of America, where the parasitoid, which is called Trioxys pallidus, which could not provide uh, control of the filbert effect. It is a very notorious pest on hazelnuts. Now, what they found that when the indigenous uh, parasitoid is not working well, the French population which they imported, within two years, it completely established. And this was one of the nodal points in the IPM program of that region. Similarly, in Himachal Pradesh, long back in the 1960s, several uh, parasitoids from America, China, the strains of Encarcia were imported for managing Sanosis girl. Uh, uh, this is on Apple, which is a notorious pest. Now, the Russian strain proved to be the best. Similarly, uh, Lixofega dietria, which is a, a taconid parasitoid for borers. Now, it was found that um, the Taiwanese strain of Lixofega was very suitable for managing the Indian sugarcane borers. So here, what I'm trying to emphasize, there are situations when the indigenous strains may not work and imported strain has to be looked at and imported. Now, uh, 
there are studies which are indicating there are geographical those populations which are collected from different regions have different parameters with respect to your to their biological parameters for example the first paper was by me uh, campbell et is chloride we collected from different regions and what we with respect to fecundity and searching ability the madhya pradesh strain was the best whereas with respect to goniosis nifantidis or good parasitoid for the coconut black headed caterpillar the erod population that is tamil nadu population was the best and cutacea flavipes hoshiarpur population was the best now for chrysopids other predators the salem population of malada and the anand population of chrysoperla and the banglo population of cryptolemus proved to be good in their biological parameters now this i am emphasizing because these kind of biological parameters are extremely important because we have to multiply them and make them available for field releases now uh, other than looking at the naturally occurring strains and trying to see if there is a difference in the Uh, biological parameters of different strains already available there are very good research efforts which are uh, looking at developing superior strains so when you are developing a superior strain we should first understand what is the desirable character that we want which we want to be a part of this superior strain what is the character which this superior strain should have for which we should have a broad base of genetic variability before we choose a strain we should have a broad base now we should also be able to measure if this character which we are identifying can be is it heritable does it move from generation to generation and we should choose a suitable selector selection regime and most importantly there should not be any undesirable effects when we are selecting a superior strain along with the selection there may be some good characters some undesirable characters should not get selected along with that so this kind of studies of selecting or developing superior strains was initiated long back even in the 1940s as you can see in this slide a strain of dalbomenus fossipennis this is a wasp a parasitic wasp of the soft fly and this could perform in very low temperature see usually in some of the temperate regions they want parasitoids which can even perform in very low temperatures like how we look for parasitoids to work in very high temperatures because we work in a tropical situation they look out for parasitoids which can work in low temperature now here they got a they could develop a strain which was tolerant to low temperature but had high fecundity longevity and progeny production now similarly uh, yuri kujo uh, has come out with a strain of trichogramma minutum he worked for 3 years and by continuously multiplying he could develop a strain which had extremely high host finding ability now at in the air we have two strains uh, which has high biological um efficiency one is a high searching ability strain of trichogramma kelonis this was done by multiplying the trichogramma in large cages instead of multiplying them in small tubes so that their searching efficiency is improving over the generations also a high temperature tolerant strain was developed at nbair now uh, i mentioned to you that there is a lot of emphasis on developing pesticide tolerant strains now there is one uh, braconet which was uh, found to be tolerant to ddt this is macrocentris and kylivorus it's a parasitoid of uh, oriental fruit moth and this was uh, you know somewhere in the 1950s this work was done now the initial high, uh, highly you know a uh, very um, uh, a work which was highly appreciated was done by margery hoy uh, on predatory mites she developed pesticide tolerant strain of a predatory mite which is called metasulus occidentalis and uh, this work was released in the field and it proved to be very effective field situation in nbr also we developed an endosulfan tolerant strain initially it was uh, developed to be tolerant to endosulfan later we have developed this strain to be tolerant to several other pesticides also now there is a suggestion 
that you could hybridize different strains and uh, come out with a strain with the new source of uh, genetic material, you know, a highly promising strain. But a word of caution, when you do it this hybridization, there is a possibility that partial sterility factors could occur. And uh, there was a fear during Dr. Marjorie Hoy's uh, research work that when you release the hybridized strains into the field, it could result in the destruction of the already developed insecticide tolerant strain of um, metaceulus. So uh, there has to be, uh, we have to be extremely careful when we develop pesticide tolerant strains. Now, uh, molecular uh, variations are also there. Now, there are molecular methods which have been utilized to identify different populations of uh, parasitoids or predators. Now, one such study was done in uh, Texas and California in the US where they have identified through molecular technology uh, different geographical uh, populations of the egg parasitoid of the glassy winged sharpshooter. Now, at NBR also, we have come up with uh, a lot of work, uh, thanks to Dr. Jalali and his team, where they have identified different species of trichogramma and they identified that they fall into three major groups, as you can see in the phylogenetic tree. The genetic variability in other different populations of parasitoids like goniosis, cotacea, and several such important parasitoids they have identified based on molecular characterization. Now here I just want to emphasize that it's not only parasitoids or predators, host populations also have different uh, molecular variations. For example, fall armyworm, which is a, a latest pest, which was uh, which has entered our country. Populations have been collected from different areas of our country, and it has been found that there is clear variations, and uh, some of them are con constrain, and some of them are uh, rice strain. So these kind of variations can only be identified through molecular uh, studies. Now, there are bacterial symbionts. I think you must have heard about Wolbachia. Now, uh, bacterial symbionts in strains are supposed to be contributing to the fitness of a strain. Now, this I want to explain by two examples, one from India. Um, what they found was that after five generations of transmission of the Wolbachia infection in Trichogramma chilonis, Trichogramma achiae, Trichogramma japonicum and Cotacea, all these parasitoids, what they studied was that by uh, generations after generations, when the infection was transmitted, it led to a great increase in fecundity. So in some strains where there is a Wolbachia association, we find that it performs better. Now, another uh, one study I want to point out outside India, the, um, the Teletokis um, uh, Wolbachia infected uh, uh, strain of Trichogramma brassicae and the Erinotokis uninfected strain are of the same species, but they are considered as two separate strains because one is Teletokis Wolbachia infected, the other is Erinotokis non-infected. Now, um, why we are thinking about genetic variations and biological control? In this context, I would like to emphasize that genetic fingerprinting is extremely important because we have to determine the diversity of the naturally occurring strains Suppose it is in different locations, we may get it on different hosts, it could be during different reasons. Now, using this genetic variation, taxonomics can clarify the status of the natural enemy. We can decide whether the samples of natural enemies should be, see, suppose we get from different regions, whether we can release it together or we are supposed to release it separately and after releasing a particular strain using genetic fingerprinting we can uh, we can trace how the uh, strain is performing in the field situation and we can determine the effectiveness of one particular strain and after colonizing whether there are variations in the genetic structures whether it is creating any change in the genetic structure all this can be done using genetic fingerprinting now sometimes we find that parasitoids are integrated with microbials you can use bt and parasitoids together or you can use metarhizium and parasitoid together so there is one interesting study by shenot and rafa and what they have found was that 
the compatibility of Cotacea melnocilla, that is a very uh, useful braconid parasitoid, and some strains are are compatible, whereas some strains are not. Similarly, Trichogramma ole, which is an egg parasitoid again, it the same parasitoid, Trichogramma ole, performed differently based on the host pheromone of the same species, but the different strain behaves differently. Now, uh, all these superior strains, they have to be evaluated in field situations. Now, this is a beautiful example where uh, Dr. Jalali and his team have uh, released these superior strains of trichogramma, uh, both pesticide and high temperature tolerance strains in large areas of cotton, rice, sugarcane, maize, fruit and vegetables, leading to huge savings for the farmers. And this fetched them the uh, award, uh, NABAD award, and uh, similar variations are also present in entomopathogenic nematodes. I think you know about entomopathogenic nematodes and in India, the common ones are Stainer, Nema and Heterorhabditis. Now, within the, these two species, there are variations. Now, the variations in the strains determines how effective they are in infecting and killing specific pests. Now, the superior species and strains which have been identified by NBAIR the field trials conducted in different parts of the country have indicated they can control on par with chemical pesticides. Now, this is a beautiful example of an entomopathogenic nematode, how they can perform in a different way. Now, Steiner, Nima, Chola, Shannon, say, is a uh, entomopathogenic nematode, which was collected from Udaga Mandalam, Tamil Nadu. ICRCPRS was responsible for giving this strain to our scientist, Dr. Patil. Now, the laboratory studies were conducted in NBR. They could get mortality. Dr. Patil could find mortality of the wax moth larvae, but this nematode could not reproduce in Bangalore conditions. However, the same isolate in Udagamandalam, in CPRS lab, it could multiply, it could reproduce, it could uh, effectively control the PTM moth, even at very low dosages. So here I want to tell that the strains can perform differently in different regions. So it is not that they perform in a similar way in all the regions. Now, biopesticides, we generally call them the different strains as isolates. It's very important to think of isolates of biopesticides when we think of using them for biocontrol. Now, this is by Dr. Ramanujam and his team. Now, he has identified several isolates of entomopathogenic uh, fungus like verticillium, buaria, metarhizium. Now, in general, if you see this uh, uh, slide, you can make out that the isolate VL8, BB5A, and MA4 were extremely effective on several sucking pests like Aphis gossypii, Brevicorine brassicae, Aphis crassivora, on crops, brinjal, cabbage, and cowpea. Now, some of the entomofungal pathogens can behave as endophytes. They get into the system of the plant and thus prevent uh, the pest infestation. Now, all fungal pathogens cannot behave as endophytes. Here again, I want to emphasize on the importance of the isolate. As you can see in the plate, these are the endophytic isolate, BB5A, BB7, BB14, and so on. Some of the isolates which very clearly proved that they can behave as endophytes. Now, entomopathogenic fungi can also be used for the management of locusts. I think all of you are aware how much of stress and uh, uh, pain this particular pest is causing to the Indian farmer. Now, in UK, they have come out with a, a commercial product which is called green muscle. This is actually metarhizium anisoplea. Uh, the variety is acridium. Now, this strain is not available in India. And if we have to use it, we have to import. Now, what Dr. Ramanujam and his team, they have done is they had one isoplea isolate which is originally derived from paddy grasshopper which they tried uh, to see if this can be used against desert locust and also two other strains MA35 and MA4 which are broad spectrum strains uh, we have sent it to different centers in Rajasthan and uh, Punjab and Gujarat for testing against the locust this is still in the testing phase now, here I want to say, when the locusts were found in, uh, in the field situations, some of our colleagues from uh, uh, Rajasthan had sent uh, 
fungus infected uh, locusts. So we were very excited. Dr. Ramanujam was thinking that this must be a strain of uh, metarhizium, but it turned out to be aspergillus only. But there is a very encouraging news that MA4, the isolate from Dr. Ramanujam's lab, which is very effective against white grubs, uh, diamondback moth and aphids, it could also infect echa grasshopper. Now grasshoppers and locusts belonging to the same group of insects, this could work against the locust. So this has been sent to uh, Rajasthan for testing. Now Bt also has got various strains. Now some strains of Bt can work on moth larvae on plants while some are specific to flies and mosquitoes. As you all know, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is rhylensis has made it very uh, it has made it possible to control the mosquitoes and it is a it is almost a commercial product now at nbair two beautiful isolates have been developed by dr rangeshwaran one is btg4 which is for lepidopteran pest and one is btan4 now the interesting aspect in this study is that bt is capable of expressing crystal protein proteins which can be toxic to both Lepidopteran and Coleopteran. Two kinds of insects, two groups of in insects it can target. Also, NBR for the first time has come out with a liquid formulation of PT. Now here, what I want to emphasize is that instead of going for a commercial imported BT, we have looked for indigenous isolates of BT. Now, I think what more example we can have for Atmanirbharata, isn't it, that we think of what is a available with us and try to use that. Now, Pseudomonas flor uh, uh, fluorescence, which is generally used for disease management, can also be used for controlling pests like thrips. Now, this is by Dr. Kandan, who found that this particular isolate, a one isolate of pseudomonas fluorescence, which is called PFDWD, could control thrips also. Now, when fall armyworm entered our country, in me, immediately we didn't think of importing anything. Within our uh, repository, whatever was available, our scientists started looking out for the best isolate which can target for. Now, four of them were found to be extremely effective. One is MA35, one is B25 and two entomopathogenic nematode isolates, that is heterorhabditis indica 101 and heterorhabditis indica 38. Now, all these have been field tested in different parts of the country, and the first two are in the process of getting commercialized. Now, why does uh, biocontrol succeed or fail? It is not always is because the bicontrol agent is a failure. Sometimes it can be due to strainal variations also. So an example uh, from outside India, Cotasia flavipus was released in East and South Africa. Initially, there was no success, but gradually over the years, it was found that in almost all the areas where it was released, it was a success. Now here, I want to point in one particular aspect. See, uh, in uh, Kenya, a single population from Pakistan was released. It was released in 93 and by 97, 98, it established. Whereas in India, a large number of populations were collected and sent to Africa. This was released in Zimbabwe and Zambia. In 1999, the Indian populations, large number of populations were released and they also got established in 2004. So now this indicates the strains which were released in Kenya and Zimbabwe were different, but both of them established. But in earlier examples, we have seen that some strains did not work. So there is a reason to look at why a certain um, uh, population works and why it doesn't in some cases. This is an example where I want to show you that um, virus was released for managing the coconut rhinoceros BT. Now, this was uh, used in several uh, sites in Fiji, Mauritius, Papua New Guinea, and so on. Now, it could re reduce the rhinoceros damage within 1.5, one and a half years, it could reduce. But after 40 years, in many of the pl places, again, the infestation increased. Finally, the research indicated that the population of rhinoceros beetle which is there in Guam is tolerant to virus. Virus is not able to kill that particular population. Now here I want to tell you, it's not only the bioagent strainal variation which may 
makes a difference. It's also the host population variation. The host, the same pest in different places could be a different strain altogether. Now, when such a situation comes, how do people tackle this? Now, this is a beautiful example how in New Zealand they tackled. You have to listen to this carefully because it is a little complicated. The Moroccan biotype of a parasitoid, which is called Microptonus ethiopoidus. In New Zealand, this was used for controlling a notorious weevil, which is called Cytona uh, discoideus. Now, Cytona is also in another species, Cytona lepidus is a pest on Lucerne also. It is another pest. Now, Moroccan biotype of Microptonus is working very well there, but they wanted a parasitoid for controlling another weevil. If they imported uh, the Microptonus a general um, uh, non-parthenogenetic type of microptonus, it would affect the performance of the Moroccan biotype, which was already doing a good job. So to uh, allow the Moroccan biotype to perform well, what they have done is they imported a parthenogenetic biotype so that the parthenogenetic biotype will also perform for one cytona and the Moroccan biotype can work well on the other cytona. So this is called conditional release. So when you have to tackle the differences in biotypes or strains, you may have to take such wonderful decisions by which you are um, allowing the parasitoids to work well. Now the conclusion and questions which I want to put forth when we have good bioagents in nature, do we have to look for them or do we have to immediately think of, you know, uh, uh, developing a new strain? No. When you have natural populations, what you should do is you should try to bank on them, look for naturally superior strains there rather than developing superior strains. For example, a high temperature tolerant uh, strain of a phytus was obtained and what they found was that the naturally uh, adapted strain behaved extremely well and that was more effective than the one which was developed through selection. Now, uh, through laboratory studies, we can do a very good study to try to see if it is really a good strain, but we cannot conclude unless we see the field performance, because sometimes the laboratory strain and the field performance, there is a variation. So to ensure that there is a fit and adaptable strain, we have to develop protocols on how to identify and evaluate the good strains. So uh, thank you all for your patient hearing. Thank you. Now, can we uh, have the next presentation? Thank you very um, much, ma'am, for a uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I thank, you, thank you, Richa. Uh, thank you, madam, for giving good uh, presentation as a keynote. Uh, you have talked about the identification of bioagents and strains, different strains of all the biocontrol agents. And also you talk about the uh, Cryptolemus montrogeri as a good predator for grape wine. And you also talk about uh, pathogens, EPN. So very nice presentation. Then I request uh, co-chairman, madam, you start your session.